But anyway, welcome everyone. Nice to see you all. And I'm delighted to finally have uh, here to talk to uh, Dr. Robert Svoboda, uh, whose wonderful um, work on Ayurveda I have been perusing, but not thoroughly still, due to being foolishly busy. Uh, but uh, I already learned a bunch of things that delighted me. And um, for years, people have telling me, you've got to talk to Robert about Oh, you, do you know Robert about Yes. Da, 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 da. And I do know a little bit in the sense of have seen your manifestations, Robert. But uh, I haven't met you, I'm sad to say. And I'm delighted to do so. And um, so finally, we managed to get a podcast going. And so there we are. So welcome. So how are you? Would you? Is there anything you'd like to start out with, particularly today? Um. No, just to say that it's a, a great pleasure to meet you as well. And I, I uh, of course, have uh, heard quite a bit about you over the years. So I'm glad that our mutual friend, Chandra Easton, has been able to bring us together. I know, isn't that? She's, she's so wonderful. She's Indeed. really great. I love her chanting with uh, Nina and so on. Yes. And friendship with, um, with the wonderful reincarnation of Machik Labdan that we have out in Colorado. Yes. And who was an old friend of mine, and I'm so happy she was finally recognized as somebody's reincarnation yes. because she deserved it after a lot of her struggles and travels and studies and whatever, you know, 100%. So, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm, and I apologize for my hair, although I am cultivating. I have a friend, Peter Sellers, who is a theater director Mm, yeah, he's not the Peter Sellers who was the wonderful Pink Panther. It's a little different spelling, and he's a he lives out on UCLA. He's a professor there, and he invites me to his classes. And he has hair that's in straight up like that high. It's amazing. And um, in a way, when when I mine goes out of control and I lose my hairbrush, like it's happened right now, I can't find it. Uh, it gets like that. So maybe I'll leave it like that. I don't know. <laughs> I think it looks fine. I took the precaution of wetting mine down. Oh, well, that would do it. <laughs> and therefore, it is much more manageable. It does look, it does look more civilized. I, I like that. And, uh, you know, I love it. I didn't know that in Sri Lanka, they, had, they have Ayurveda there, but they have it with a Buddhist flavor. And um, is that because they, they have a claim, a lineage from Vagbata or something, or that Vagbata was a Buddhist or something? Is that, is that the claim? Or can you tell me about that? There are so many claims. Um, and I think probably the, the basis of, the basis of Ayurveda may be, as its name suggests from the Vedas, but very likely, the reason why it developed so much in India was because of the Emperor Ashoka, who yeah. was converted to Buddhism after conquering the Eastern Kingdom of Kalinga and realizing the implications of conquest right. and war. Right. And he is renowned for having set up uh, clinics and hospitals and all sorts of, of medical infrastructure uh -huh. on this, in the part of the subcontinent that he was ruling, but he also sent out uh, missionaries to all parts mm -hmm. of the world. And mm -hmm. my suspicion is that um, it was thanks to uh, Ashoka that, um, that, that a good deal of medical knowledge reached uh, to Sri Lanka. Right, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's before Vagbata, right? Yeah. Oh, yes, well before. Ahsoka was, what, about th roughly 3rd century BC, and Vagbata, nobody really exactly knows, but probably more like 7th century CE. Yes. So, you know, maybe a thousand years later. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, the, the um, I did study when I was... Um, a student uh, trying to be a monk and determined actually to be a monk with my Mongolian uh, teacher, first teacher telling me, yes, I know you're determined to be a monk and you really want to be, I know that, but you're not going to be able to stay a monk. So it's a, dis it's a disgrace in Tibet to be a monk and then quit, it's not like Thailand, and so don't do it. And I just wouldn't listen, you know. 
being whatever, 20 year old omniscient, you know, silly. It, it is, <laughs> it is surprising. Uh, I, I always remember the words of Mark Twain. When I was 15, I was amazed at how ignorant my father was. And when I became 21, I was astounded at how much the old man had learned in six years. <laughs> That's really good. I didn't know that one. That's a really good one. Yes. Yes, I a little bit had that uh, that luck. Not too much, unfortunately. My, my dad died around that time when I was 21. But before that, we luckily had a good contact. And I did realize his mystical side. Hmm. And uh, and that's really wonderful. How did you? How did you? Where did you grow up in the states, or and how did you get involved in all this? You, I noticed, noticed in the in your introduction to your book, you thank Vimala Ananda as your maybe root guru. His, was he your root guru or medical he, in the medical thing or whatever? He he preferred to think of himself as my mentor. Yes. Um, and I met him after I had already been studying in India for a year and a half. Uh, I grew up in the Southwest, I w uh, in Texas, Louisiana, mm -hmm. Oklahoma, graduated uh -huh. from high school and college in Oklahoma. Uh -huh. And uh, I was very good at taking examinations. So I graduate, when I graduated from college with a bachelor's degree, I was still just 18. Oh, wow. And I didn't know what to do being 18 and, of course, thinking I knew all kinds of things. <laughs> and I arranged to get myself admitted to medical school. And then I thought, I must go somewhere exotic before I go to medical school. So I, I went to Africa, and mm -hmm. I crossed Africa overland, and mm -hmm. I got to Kenya, and I found myself invited on an ethnographic expedition, and um, and it just so happened they were looking for they wanted to uh, document how the the traditions of this particular tribe, which had been not visited by any outsiders and, until very recently, wanted to document their a number of their. Uh, uh, rituals, including uh -huh. uh, the ritual of joining the tribe, and so they invited me to join the tribe for that purpose. Okay. So I'm proud to be the first white member of the Pokot tribe of North Kenya. I see. Oh, wow. And then I was pretty sure that I wasn't ready to go back to medical school. So I wrote a letter and said, I'm not ready to go back yet. And the dean sent me a very nice letter saying, we'll save your seat for one year. And I remember the part about uh, it is important to do this sort of thing before barnacles start to accumulate on the ship of life. <laughs> and I agree. I believe it is very that important before the ship of life is covered with barnacles, which slows right. it down dramatically, that right. one should go out and do things. So right. I flew to England, where my sister was conveniently um, studying. I gave her my spears to take back to the U.S. <laughs> I had a, a, a special headdress made out of mud and painted and so on that I had a barber cut off and I sent that to the U.S. And then I crossed overland to Nepal. <laughs> Great. Wow. And I, I didn't like India uh, initially. In fact, I got um, uh, all my I, my possessions stolen in Bihar. Oh dear. So I started to have a bad opinion of Bihar from the beginning. Right. I love Nepal, and um, I might have stayed on in Nepal for quite a while. We had family friends working for mm -hmm. USAID there, and I had a friend mm -hmm. from college in the Peace Corps. That's yeah. where I heard about Ayurveda, from the Peace Corps doctor the first right. time. Right. Then I heard that His Holiness the Dalai Lama was going to give a Kala Chakra initiation in Bodhagaya in January of 1974. Oh, yes. Wow. And I had heard of the Dalai Lama, and I had no clue at all about what a Kala Chakra was. But everybody who was anybody in the expat community of Kathmandu was headed down, and I felt like that was definitely going to be the place to be. So I arrived cool. in Bodhagaya with 500,000 of my dearest friends. And 
attended the Kala Chakra, and it was, um, I, I don't know how to, I, I don't know what adjective to use, let's just say mind-boggling. Exactly. To be part of that entire thing, and of course to have darshan of His Holiness, though I must say that the Lama who impressed me the most was uh, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, mm -hmm. who of course, he was a very big man. He was very yes, tall, yes. very large, but he just, I didn't even know what an aura was, but I could just see that there was something radiating out of him that yes. was totally different from anything else. And I yes. thought to myself, I don't know what these guys have, but I need to have some of it myself. <laughs> That's great. And then I didn't know how, I had no clue as to how to do that, but I got mm. on a train, I went to Bombay, I was there for a few days. I happened literally just on the street to meet some people who introduced me to some people, who introduced me to some people, who introduced me to the most eminent Ayurvedic doctor in India at that moment. And I said, I'd like to study Ayurveda instead of modern medicine. He said, you're in luck because uh, in just three months, uh, the Chilak Ayurved Nahavidalai college in Pune is going right. to start um, a, a, a batch of students who will be taught in the English medium. Yes, oh. you'll have to learn <laughs> Sanskrit within nine months, but you have nine months. So, um, and you can have three months to get your visa and then you can start and then everything will be great. And so he gave me a letter saying, admit this student. I went to Pune. I went into the, I'm, I'm sure I was the first non-Indian to visit the place. I went in there, I showed the letter. They weren't happy about it, but they didn't have any choice because he was, he was the man you could not say no to in the Ayurvedic world at that time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Was that Vimalananda? No, no. no, no, his name was Pandit Shiva Sharma. Shiva Sharma, okay. Shiva Sharma. Uh -huh. uh, I met Vimalananda after a year and a half because I was, I, was, I didn't want to make my parents pay for my education, so I had mm -hmm. saved up some money working when I was in the U.S., mm -hmm. but I needed a little more money. So I got a, a youth grant from the U.S. Office of edu uh, 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 Education, or was it the National, Endow National Endowment for the Humanities? Oh, man. And they gave me some money to research just to give sort of an ethnographic report on what right, was right. going on with Ayurveda in Pune at that time. Uh -huh. And I was interviewing people. So uh, Vimalananda was one of the people I was interviewing. He lived in Bombay, but he had come to Pune because he owned thoroughbred racehorses. <laughs> really? And so I went to interview him and, um, and he and I became, uh, uh, we enjoyed one another's company, and then pretty soon I was spending a lot of time in Bombay, and I ended up spending 10 years at the race course. I became his authorized racing agent. So <laughs> while I was studying Ayurveda, I was also involved in thoroughbred racing, which is, I, I loved the horse part of it, the, the gambling <laughs> part of it. I mean, the, human beings... Uh, 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 hu human beings become criminals very easily. <laughs> That's amazing. So what you mean? Do they would your people on you would run you race your horses and then they you have to take bets or make bets or what? what uh, yes, I mean uh, it in in India they have um, they have just like they have over here. They have you know that you put your money into sort of a complicated machine and it comes out. But they also have licensed bookmakers like they do in the okay. UK. Yes, yes. And so um, there were certain ways that you could um, you could bet money and you could avoid paying the tax on it on all of the money you bet if you had an arrangement with the bookie. And I the see. bookies were all trying to figure out how to make the uh, favorite horses lose so they could pocket the money. And everybody was... Everybody was trying to manipulate everybody else. It was a really great education in human nature. That's, that sounds like it. At the same time, you were studying Ayurveda. Definitely. Copy, and 
Vimal, Vimal Ananda liked to you. use Ayurvedic treatments on his horses, also homeopathic, also sometimes, yes. you know, naturopathic things. And so, right, right. so that was, uh, I learned a lot from that also, what sort of things are good for horses then, or not good so for horses. So he was a horse racing guy, but he also was a, what, a Godika? He was a yogi, right? He was he, a, he, he, had, he had started off life uh, living in a very rich family. Uh -huh. But then he went off and became a sadhu for a while, and then he studied Ayurveda, studied Jyotisha, Indian astrology, right, right. and uh, he studied music. He was a brilliant musician, and uh, he could cook really well. I mean, he could do. He was a he was a very uh, versatile character. Amazing, amazing. He's, he's passed away, I presume. He passed away in 1983. So, oh, that's the same as my teacher passed away. 38 huh? years ago. Uh -huh. My, my uh, I guess, Yvangel, my Kalmyk teacher, he was Kalmyk. Uh -huh. I, I met him in New Jersey after going to India for one year on overland as a fakir. And uh, then got interrupted because my father died. And when I came back, I met this Mongolian who lived in New Jersey, like wow. half, one and a half hours from New York, you know. Wow. So the least likely place to find a guru for a New Yorker. Is Particularly New back then. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, anyway, how amazing. The Vimala Ananda. I just love his name. It reminds me of Vimala Kirti. Yes. Vimala Kirti guy, like doing all kinds of regular worldly things that, and yet maintaining like an enlightened perspective from his basic insights and so on. That's Indeed. wonderful. Wonderful. And you, so you inherited his, um, he was your, well, your mentor, yeah, right? Yes, he, he, uh, he uh, always said that he preferred not to have disciples himself. So, um, so the person that he had he had three gurus and I, of whom i met one uh -huh. who was a sadhu who lived in eastern in uh, southeast india in near the city of vishakhapatnam oh yes uh -huh. and uh he was uh he was a very he was an extremely interesting character mm -hmm. um who who actually and i saw it many times and i testify i mean I suppose it could have been created by somebody, but who would have thought to do that back then? He had a certificate that from the Archaeological Survey of India, mm -hmm. and it said this is to certify that Jatala Sad that uh, Sadhu Ram das uh -huh. was found. It didn't say in Samadhi, but it, it the implication was in Samadhi right. during excavation in the Kurda Road Taluka of Puri district of Orissa State in the year 1905. <laughs> wow! So he had been, apparently, it was, they were excavating a temple that had collapsed 200 years earlier. Wow. And they found him in Samadhi in the ruins. And the certificate didn't say in Samadhi, but I heard about this from, oh, yeah, from just... the people around him. Yes. And um, back at that time, they had special people in Puri who, you know, most people want to get into Samadhi. They had special people to bring you down out of Samadhi. I see. But they brought him down out of Samadhi, and he lived for another 88 years. That's amazing. Did he say when he went into Samadhi? He would never talk about that, but he did. He would occasionally say something like, I remember what happened 400 years ago or something like that. Oh so he was probably, you know, at least 100 when he went into Samadhi. That's really something. He was quite a character. Uh, uh, what, when, as long as I knew him, I mean, he, the, the, the story was he had been a breathitarian earlier in his life. But when yeah. I knew him, he would drink this much cola drink every day uh -huh. and this much milk. And his only solid food was tobacco. And I don't mean he chewed it up and spit it out. I mean, he would tear it, a couple of big black tobacco leaves, tear them into strips, chew them up and swallow them. Oh my goodness. And one day, I mean, I saw him do this many, many times. And one day I was thinking, he, he paid attention to everybody's thoughts very carefully. I was thinking, how is he doing that? And immediately he said, what is the use of eating? He spoke very archaic Hindi. So 
but he was kind enough to speak it simple, quiet, uh, you know, slowly so I could understand it. He said, what's the use of eating? You wear out your teeth, you wear out your digestive organs. It's much better to find something really poisonous that's easily available. And when you eat it, use internal alchemy to transform it. That's amazing. So I said, yes, Guruji. <laughs> Absolutely. That reminds me of Nagarjuna. They said Nagarjuna never ate anything. I, I, I could That's certainly he believe that. He, he, he was, you know, Nagarjuna was a great Siddha. So he, he, had, he had enough knowledge of, of Rasavidya, of alchemy, that right, he would not right. have needed to eat. Right. Anything. Well, he took some, he, may, he had some kind of a pill, right? He did, you know, a, right. a, amrita kind of thing. But he would never eat food once he got going, you know. So I guess, and that, that was his secret of, which they say, actually, they say that lady, Elizabeth Blackburn, the, the telomeres lady, she said that uh, they all agreed we had a longevity conference with His Holiness here in, uh, in Woodstock at, at Menla. And, um, and uh, they all agreed, all the Western types, that caloric restriction is the only longevity thing that's definitely, you know, that, that's no question about it. Always. I, I, things, I believe why. that has been conclusively... Right, they're all saying that. They're all that saying that's the only that's, way. That, that, that's the extreme of a caloric restriction. Yes, he was. He could have been thousand years old. That is so neat. I love you're so lucky. Extremely you know, there lucky. There are so many, so many of the arhats, right? The great, the 60 oh yes, arhats. they supposedly are buried in this cave or that cave, waiting for Maitreya. You know. Yes, they're they're keeping the. They don't need to keep the body. They can go and get another one. But they, you know, but they, in various ways, but they, uh, they do do that for some reason. They say, you know, <laughs> I think, as you actually found one, I'm so t thrilled, really. It, it's really it's amazing. And it's thanks to Vimalananda, who, who, di who did not use that name when he was alive. He just used his birth name, but he preferred for people not to know exactly what, who he was. I see, I see. How beautiful. Vimalananda. Like Vimalakirti, I really yeah. like that. And they're still there, and you still found them. That's so great. So anyway, did you get ever get back to Kala Chakra? Did you do uh, Did you do things? I, I will send you our, our beginning efforts at working on it. Text um, the text, you know. I I I uh, uh, after Kala Chakra after after whatever happened to my karmas at that time, and I certainly am extremely thankful to to His Holiness and to everybody who who was involved with that, because had I not attended that, I don't know what direction my life would have gone in, but very possibly not in the direction that it did. So, right, right. Well, but he, then he, I got very much more involved in, there I was in India, and um, so I started doing yoga and I started following more of a, um, more, more of the, uh, of the, sh I would say, I mean, it's Vimalananda himself was very eclectic. His, yeah. his, his person, his family were, uh, were members of what's called the Pushti Sampradaya, uh -huh. who are uh, uh, followers of the, of Vallabhacharya. Oh, really? The, oh, how neat. The, so that's the uh, same Sh as Shamdas, for Brahma. example. Yes, Shamdas was my dear friend. Yes. And he introduced Mine me to Milan Baba and Milan Baba. Yes, and Milan Baba, exactly. Some so, dialogues. Yeah, they're in Mumbai. He's, he's based in Mumbai, right? Ex exactly. Yeah, right. So uh, uh, that whole, uh, and I was fortunate to meet Shamdas's guru, Prithamesh Lalji, and he yeah. was called Prithamesha because Prithama, of course, in Sanskrit means first. Right. And Vallabhacharya, there were seven, seven seats, seven mm -hmm. Vallabhacharyas in India, but he was, he is the, his, his lineage is the, from the oldest son, and so is the oldest lineage. I see, I see, I didn't know that. Oh, I love those people. They're really great. They, th they think Shankara is too dualistic. <laughs> Oh, I, and I agree entirely also. It's, and Vimalananda also said, you know, Shankara, he, he, he made it a point to, to wander around India doing Dig Vijaya, you know, debating with everybody. But if you really believe in absolute non-dualism, 
who are you debating with? <laughs> what right. are you debating? That's right. Why are you not sitting quietly and being non-dualistic? I know, so. I know. Well, you know the Buddhist version of it. He finally did lose. He lost to Dharmakirti or somebody. They say. I mean, they have different versions. And of course, the 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 Shank the Shankara followers say that that it was exactly the opposite. I, I know. I know. That's which is Every, fine, which is good. You which know, is good. I, I'm which very, very good. now. I, I be, I'm very into it nowadays because His Holiness has my current mentor, His Holiness, who I can't really get him to really be a mentor. And see, my original guru was like that too. He never would say he was my guru. He said, I'm not your guru. He said, no way. He said it would be because I will, I will scold you and tell you things you won't want to hear, and then you'll be mad at me, and that would be a great sin for you. And then I would have caused you a great sin by pretending to be your guru. He said, so I'm just your Kalyana Mitra, you know, your Kewe Shenyan, your spiritual friend. So he always refused to take that thing. And he's right, I did it. I disobeyed him at different times. So I was especially frustrated with him because he wouldn't let me meditate. He absolutely said, and I was, when I first encountered the Buddha Dharma with through him, which I think was the real thing, he, I just was ready to leave the body at any minute. You know, I would slip, and he would show up at four in the morning, like, what are you doing? Like, have some yogurt, why aren't you sleeping? Like, What's the matter with you? And he always blocked me from doing it, which, uh, which I got very frustrated about until like 30 years later. And I realized he saved me from going into some state that would have become addictive to me and right. prevent my learning other things, you know. Right. And, uh, and uh, you know, what they call, you know, obtaining a certain type of cessation at the wrong time. Yeah. You know, before cultivating something more. And he, oh, yeah, I was telling you a story. He, when he left me in Dharamsala, because he got tired, he said, of me bugging him to be a monk, left me with his holiness. He said, but he told his holiness, don't make him a monk. <laughs> but uh, then he said, well, you're the holiness, whatever you decide, you know, but I'm just an old monk. Holiness. But, but, I, but I, he wants to be a monk, so he'll, he might convince you because he really sincerely wants to, but he, in the future, he won't be able to. I'm, or I live in America, I know, you know, now, and uh, I, I know what will happen. And so his illness was, took time, he spent a long time, and then finally he did anyway, because I, I was so de determined. And uh, he thought that would keep me together. We were buddies, you know. So that spoils my being his disciple, because he, he won't tolerate the sort of guru, Dakshina thing. With him and me, because he's, we're fellow students in a way. Right. You know, he's only six years older, and he had me studying with his teachers. Mm. And um, typical thing is, one time I was, I was doing a farewell uh, audience, having been there for a year in uh, 1980, and there were some small kids, you know, ex monk with many kids. Mm. He used to laugh, say, "What happened to my monk?" And I'd be jumping in with all these kids. <laughs> anyway. So I'm trying to show the kids how to be a proper, you know, devotee. And so I'm trying to bow. And as I'm going down for the first bow, just to show off to them, normally when we met, we would work on things and I wouldn't. But I was doing it. He grabbed my hand and I fell over. <laughs> as if he thought I was supposed to be shaking hands, but he mischievously grabbed it. And he knew I was off balance and I fell over, flopped over on the floor, which broke the ice and the kids were roaring with laughter. And then they all sort of flopping on the floor. It was a very funny moment, but that's typical. His all in this mischievous kind of side to him. And um, and my wife was saying, see, I told you not to bother to be formal. She told me. He was all, all on board with it. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, but oh yeah, so so the Geshe Law arrived with uh, Yishi Denden. I don't know if you I, to meet him. I was very fortunate to meet Dr. Denden. Oh, oh my goodness. 30 years ago, maybe, oh, and, and to have him take my pulse. That was, oh, it was, yeah. a, it was a, a, what a wonderful man. What a oh, knowledgeable, what, oh, I mean. What a diagnostician he was. A man who was aligned with, um, I like to call it the Ayurvidya, but it's that, that principle, that, that, that Shakti that exists in the universe that is, is, whose purpose is to help to created beings come back into uh into into health into harmony and right. i mean it was just flowing through him it was just oh, so yeah. obvious it was it what was a, what um, a fine man 
so amazing. And he really is. I think he's the only Tibetan ever to receive the Padma Shri Award before he died recently. Oh, really? From, uh, the only yeah. Tibetan? Oh, my dear. As far as I know, they never gave to Dalai Lama, I guess, if for fear of China. Maybe. Kind of war like maybe, that, maybe. The government uh, himself, and, or to someone like Dingo Kenze, or one of those really great older people, older people. They never did. But somehow they picked him out because I remember before he got it, I saw a paper. I was in Darmstadt. I saw him luckily that last time I didn't see him. And and um, there was a newspaper article like, oh, the planes are going to Congress all the time, but they're not all going to see the Dalai Lama. All kinds of people going to see Ishi Dundin. You know? mm. And at that time, he was 93, 94. Oh, wow. He passed away. He passed at 94. And uh, he... Just a year after that. And actually, I was there when he went to the presidential palace and he wanted me to go with him, but I had a flight. I mean, it was stupid of me. I wish I had gone, but I didn't. But anyway, he was so great. And anyway, the, my teacher said, you have to study the medicine. And I said, what do you mean? I don't want to study the medicine. You know, unlike you, I didn't go. I wasn't like on a waiting list for medical school matriculation. And I said, no, I want to study Shunyata. I want to say enlightenment. He said, oh, later, later, maybe you can learn something but about that. But uh, now, if you want to understand Tibetans, you have to understand the medicine, if you want to understand life. And so you have to study medicine. You study with this man. And he brought him over to where we were staying. <laughs> okay, I guess, so again, luckily, luckily, I did study with him. And, uh, I was, he had me reading pulses. I memorized the uh, root tantra. Oh, you know, okay. and uh, and I memorized I mem memorized the pulse tantra, also the zado, but then and unfortunately I've forgotten because then I didn't practice. You know, right. then, except for the year I was there, he would make me do like instructional reading, and then I would say something, then he would criticize it. You know, uh -huh. and it's amazing those verses pop into your mind. You know, when you feel a pulse, it's an amazing system to train a completely unintuitive person, as I fancied myself, just a you know left brain like. Mathemat mathematically oriented sort of person, but I did actually get some sort of insights like that. But he was incredible. You know, people, I would translate for him when people would come, English speaking, few people in those days, and uh, 60s this was, or early 60s. Mm. And uh, I would translate for him and he would say, oh yeah, you've been, you've been in a desert place for like two years, and you know, Peace Corps people, people like that would come and he would like recite where they'd been, what they did, what their problem was, and they would just totally freak out. And uh, he was amazing. And the, the American uh, or Swiss doctor who was at uh, the Western Hospital in Dharamsala would re recommend patients to him, you know, of all kinds, especially for certain things, you know. Right. And... Um, but we didn't, I didn't know anyway, any Ayurvedic people who were helping the Tibetan. So in a way, it was Tibetan Ayurveda, I guess you'd have to call it. But there's no Indian thing, you know, that whole thing. Do you know the Tibetan thing about the Buddha teaching medicine Buddha emanating all these chapters and things, you know, et cetera? You, you do know that, I'm sure. I, 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 I know, I wouldn't say that I'm well educated, but I certainly have, um, I have some knowledge of that. So there's no precursor, though. I, I am always fan, fantasized that the Utok, uh, Yandeng Gompo's organization of that in Tibetan was based on, you know, Ashtanga Hridaya, and that there would be some connection with the Medicine Buddha from India. But I think you can't find it, right? I think, it go, as you say, it goes back to Charak Sanhita and the, the, the actual Ayurvedic things. Yes, and even, you know, the Vagbhata is a compilation of both the Charaka Samhita and the Sushruta Samhita. Right, right. He, imp he digested them, he improved them, and he converted it into verse, which is much easier to uh, memorize than prose. Right, right. And, uh, you know, there, I actually, um, uh, a friend of mine who, who was a classmate who just a couple of weeks ago, sadly, uh, 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 passed away. His daughter is was also an Ayurvedic uh, physician. They come from a family of Ayurvedic physicians, and she um, was in the process a couple of years ago of learning by heart the entire Ashtanga Hridayam. Oh, really? Wow. Which is about nine thousand verses. So, wow! It's it's. Um, 
the, uh, and that's the way originally that people, that, that's why it took you 12 years to study because you would memorize all 9,000 verses and whenever somebody came in front of you, you would use, you would take the verse that you had been taught and that would help you remember the commentary that your guru had provided to you. Uh -huh. And then you would be able to, then you'd be able to, to do something useful to whoever right, right. it was that was in front of you. Right, right. Yeah, that is wonderful, that way that they have the root text and so on. So do you yourself practice Ayurveda directly? Um, uh, I, well, I used to, up until a couple of years ago, consult with people. I can't say practice because I have a license to practice in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, I... I'm the, the first non-Indian to graduate from a college of Ayurveda and be licensed to practice. That's awesome. And but, was your classmate, by the way, the guy who's now in New Mexico? Was he a classmate of yours? Uh, no, he was, uh, he was uh, one of my teachers. He was one of the teachers. Okay. Dr. Vasant Lod, yes. He's uh, 10 or 11 years older than I am. And, and he had, in fact, just recently become a teacher there. Right, right. And, and he was, he was actually the favorite teacher of all of my classmates, whether they studied in English. Most of them studied in Marathi, which is the local language yeah, of Marathi, yes, Maharashtra, yeah. Bombay and Pune. Yes, yes, right. But he was always the favorite teacher because he spent, he was always ready to ask questions and explain things. And he was very knowledgeable, very, uh, very, very fine teacher. Oh, that's one. Do you, so you don't live in India now? Then you're not in India. Uh, Where are you actually? For the for the pet right at the moment, I'm in Houston, Texas. Oh, right. Which is oh, wow. Where I've been for um, most of the pandemic with my sister. Uh, I see. I see. Um, for the past uh, thirty years or so, I've spent four to six months of every year in India, but otherwise, I've stayed in. Um, many other places. Um, I right. have spend a certain amount of time in Costa Rica in the forest every year. Oh, lovely. And uh, I am looking forward to getting back to India. Of course, recently I haven't got back there. I um, spend a, a month or two in, uh, or I have been spending a month or two in Australia every year, also in the rainforest. I like being away from the city, but I end up spending lots of time in the city, including Houston and Bombay. Yes, right, right, right. How nice. Wonderful. You're writing a lot, right? And you're, you wrote a lot of books on the Agoricas. That's what I knew you uh, about from you. Is yes. You wrote uh, on them, right? About that, about Ayurveda, about Jyotisha, Indian divination. Right, right, right. And at the moment, I'm, um, I'm actually uh, translating a book called the Navnat Bhakti Sara, which is um, a, a book in medieval Maharashtrian, Marathi, uh -huh. um, about the nine knots, Machinder Nath, Gorak Nath, etc., oh. who, who appear as, as members of the group of 84 Siddhas also. Yeah, sure. Wow. Uh, I believe Machinder is... Is Mina there writing Bhakti. or teachings? Is it their writings or teaching? Louis Pa, yeah. Uh, right, Louis Pa. Um, they are, it's, um, it's stories about them, but they're stories that are meant to be used as, um, as ways of focusing one's attention when there is a problem in one's life that one wants to overcome what they call in, in Sanskrit an upaya, a remedy. Sure. So, I, I mean, there are all kinds of remedies. You can, take, uh, you can take herbal remedies, you can take mental remedies, but this is more of a mumbo jumbo sort of uh, working sure. with things that oh, are- Wonderful. Well, I look uh, forward to that. Is that, uh, is that, are you nearly done or you're in the middle I'm, of it? I'm halfway through. It's oh, 40 wow. chapters. Um, of about roughly 200 verses per chapter. I'm in the middle of chapter 19. Oh, wow. Um, and I have to say, medieval Marathi is not... Very few people, even in Maharashtra, uh, can read it nowadays. 
<laughs> but I'm extremely fortunate that about um, 10 years ago, it was translated into Hindi, which uh -huh. I never studied, but I learned, um, I learned on the street just by talking. Sure, sure. But with the help of the internet and all the online dictionaries, um, and with the help of a friend who did some rough translating for me, um, uh, it's, it's much, it's That's far amazing. easier. You know my friend uh, Srikant Bahulkar? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He might be able to help too. He, he's just translated Dalai Lama's autobiography, Freedom in Exile, into Marathi. I guess modern, of course, modern Marathi. Yes. And he, he subtly teased me into agreeing, because that ends with the Nobel Prize, you know, the 1989, mm. 1990, mm. and it's been 30 years since then. So uh, with the Dalai Lama's life, so he subtly invaded me, unveiled me to do a small addendum, like an epilogue of major things that have happened to his home and so that he's done since 1990, or since he got the Nobel Prize, Award, and then to be translated into Marathi. So that just recently happened by a funny synergy, you know, coincidence. That's excellent. I, I, I met, met pr Professor... I and try to do it, but I'm going to write it maybe 15, 20 pages on that. I, I have to do it. It's my, Definitely. Du my duty. As a guru, because I guess, what do you have in um, Maharashtra? It's maybe 30, 40 million people. It's as big as France, right? Maharashtra is, no, it's, um, you know, I'm not sure. It's probably closer to 100 million. 100 million? Oh, yeah. That's 80 right. to 100, somewhere really? in there. Oh, great. Hard to keep up. Bombay okay. itself has... Uh, Bombay is the number 10 on the mega city list. Oh, wow. And it's about 26 million. Oh, just, just, oh, wow. And Pune so is, is UP, 7 or 8 million. 100 million. I didn't realize it was so big. It's incredible. That Something like that. Push the mark, you know, <laughs> growth. <laughs> when I first got to India in 62, there was only 300 million people there. Yes. And I was, it looked like a lot of people even then. You know. Now, like, you know, that's my, my, of course, my undying aim and hope in life also is to reunite Pakistan and Bangladesh to the one great subcontinent. And they can throw in Afghanistan even. And, uh, and overcome that terrible thing the British dared to do, to inflict on, on the subcontinent and, and create this awful situation of the, which now China is using most nastily, the communists there to oppress India in the worst way, you know, by buying, they claim they're buying Pakistan, now, which of course is a failed military state. And uh, it's, uh, it's just, um, I, I think they, can, they will be inevitably be reunited and we just have to do it somehow, you know. If they, I, I don't know if you know, there's that think tank in Mumbai, you may know, I forgot their, what their name is, but I have some of their publications, who they, one of them studied the opportunity cost of the division, just economically, you know, trying to divide the Indus Valley and the five rivers. Right. Into, in, it's hopeless, you know. And, um, and I think that's the only way that then China will behave geopolitically when the subcontinent is, again, the biggest, the biggest, richest thing on the planet. You know? Right. And that would be the case because it's just unviable to have these, these religious, uh, you know, uh, states, you know, that are that, uh, like Pac, you know, that are pure. Right, non-pluralistic. In other words, really, it's foundationally non-pluralistic. Right. And when India is originally the pluralistic, I mean, it's way beyond America as a melting pot. Actually, India, right, for thousands of years, absorbing all kinds of weird motorcycle gangs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, you know, some people are of the opinion that China may fragment itself. Yes, it, it may. I agree. Is that what is that what the Jyotishi say? Uh, I actually, I have a friend who's a Jyotishi who does believe that. And right. certainly, uh, China, uh, you, as we know, has, has, as with India, there have always been, pieces have been swallowed and then spat back out again. And yes, yes. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't be um, upset to see um, the PRC 
be uh, split back up into two or three or more. Different oh, yeah, it would be, it, you know, the localization is the trend that we have to see everywhere. Yes. All the all these other things are imperial leftovers, you know, that are useless, you know, useless imperial leftovers. The, the idea that somebody from like, in, if you go to Lhasa, as you, I don't know if you ever went up there, but when you go Only to Lhasa, once. you have to be on Beijing time. Yes. So the sun doesn't rise in certain seasons until 10 a.m. Or, I mean, it's ridiculous, you know, it's, yeah. it's really absurd. You know, they, they, they won't allow time zones. You know? So, I, I mean, it's just typical totalitarian attitude. And um, anyway, that's my fantasy, too. And I think it could be easily done, actually, but we'd have to, I don't know how to do it. But I've talked to people who you have their ancestral home near Lahore, you know, uh, yes. Hindu, Hindus, and they still yes. pine about it. And uh, and Muslims who used to live somewhere in the, in the, in the UP or someplace in the Himalayas had a summer place up in the Kulu Valley or something, and they and they they pine for that too. It was a ridiculous, awful thing that I think Churchill was really responsible. Frankly, they blame it on Gandhi or on Jinnah or on even Nehru. Some there's a way of blaming it on Nehruji, but uh, I think it really was the British. They as a way of holding India back, you know. Because they knew India could be the biggest country in the world easily, you know, as it always was before, you know. Well, we we do know that Churchill was responsible for. He may not have been responsible for the beginnings of the 1943 Bengal famine, but he was certainly responsible for not sending any food oh, to Bengal and taking food away from India in order to stockpile it in the UK. We know that's true. That's been proven. You know, he was a horrible colonialist, you know, no question. We also know that in 1840, before the Brits actually took over the entire subcontinent, that India's uh, was producing about 25% of global GDP. Right, 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 right. And we know that in 18, 1947, about 100 years later, its share of global GDP had gone down to somewhere between 4 and 6%. Right, right. Just raw materials to the British industry and so on. Yeah. So it's a, a little bit difficult to, to, for, for us to, to think that the effects, uh, the, 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 what the British provided to India was worth what they took away from it. Oh, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I completely agree. I totally agree with that. And, you know, I don't know, but I learned, I, I knew this guy called Harry Cahill, who used to work for the Hinduja brothers when he passed away long, some time back. But he told me this thing that I never knew about why Indian studies is so backward in America. I had never really, you know, you have these huge East Asia departments everywhere. And then Indian studies is nowhere in America academically. You know, this you know in, Indian historian at Columbia was a was a Pakistani oriented guy. You know, for example, in the in the South Asia it doesn't have a department at Columbia. It's in Middle Eastern studies. You know, for example, I mean, it's that's you find that everywhere. And I, he finally told me because the Brits knew that the American Indian nexus would all would un, unseat them, like because the Americans do have a little bit rebellious streak about right. the, the, we rebelled against the empire, right? Right. Although we've always had a faction that always wanted to behave like the British Empire, which is behaving like them. But still, but 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 we did break away. And um, he told me the story. Did you ever hear this? That Tipu Sultan sent three chests of treasure to the revolutionaries? No. And he was a Francophile, and he didn't want the British to take over. He liked the French. <laughs> and well, that I had he heard. He made him into the Gaddafi of their day, do you know what I mean? And right. wanted, wanted to slaughter him. Right. And then all three were stolen on the way by the ship captains who he entrusted them to, right. Dutch right. and other different kinds of persons. Yeah. So none of them reached the, you know, the Continental Army or George Washington or whatever. But uh, they, he did send them. And the Brits knew that he sent them, you see. So then they blocked American missionaries to go to India so that the grandchildren of the missionaries who then went to save China, they're all the Sinologists in the American universities. And there are no grandchildren of no missionaries from Mumbai or Chennai or 
Bangalore or wherever it is, there's none because they, were, they had some British missionaries, but no Americans. They wouldn't let Americans go and save, save for Jesus, save the, a few sneaked in maybe under auspices of some British missionary society, but right. they really wouldn't allow mainstream American missionaries there. And um, and so that that's how we don't have we don't have that tradition of indologists like the sinologists do. He explained that to me, Harry Cahill. That's I think I met Harry Cahill once. Was he the U.S. consul in Bombay was, for a while? Yes, yes, he was. That's right. Yeah, I I, I met him a couple of times long okay. ago. Yeah, he was a, he was a jolly fellow. I he was of, indeed. He he helped me squeeze. I created a chair when I was chairman of the religion department. I created a chair of uh, Hindu studies, which then the, one of the vice presidents later threw it away and gave the capital that I squeezed out of SP Hinduja because he never wanted to give hard money. No, they only uh, like to give a, a, a grant in the name of his son. I don't know if you know that story. That's yeah, another whole yeah. story. But anyway, he, his wife was kind of forcing him. And then I forced him to make a portion of his yearly grant collect into hard money and we were up to 1.2 million and we only had 300,000 to go and we could have seated a Hinduism chair, which we don't have in that religion department. We happen to have Jack Hawley in Barnard who happens to be into Bhakti studies, right. but we don't have a regular chair. And they all, you know, those kind of places in American universities, always they, they revert back to the Abrahamic traditions. You know. Right. Give some lip service to Islam, you know, but they they never they they very uneasy further east, <laughs> you know, basically. Indeed. Like I created a, a, a Tibetan Indo Tibetan studies chair that that I then occupied. I didn't even get a raise, but anyway, I raised the money so that I should be replaced by someone in the field. And there and in the first replacement cycle, which is now, they are hassling me about trying to change the charter. So they can hire someone in Japan studies or some bullshit, you know, which I won't let them do. So we may be at legal loggerheads, actually, because I arranged the money. You know, I, I channeled it through a nonprofit. My They're God. just so dishonest, you know, the triumphalist American academics. They suck. They, by the way, where's your, your Ayurveda book being published? Um, I, I have a, a number of different publishers. Um, oh, the one that I sent to you is published, in fact, by... The oh, publishing really company that Dr. Lod has in New Mexico. Oh, it's called the the Ayurvedic Press. Oh. It, uh, it in India. It was originally published by Penguin, and it, Penguin India still publishes it in oh, India. Good. Oh, good! I didn't know that. I thought I thought it was not yet published. Oh no! These are uh, uh, many of them in this country are published by a company called Lotus Press, and. I um, a couple of them are published by a, a small company called Namarupa. Oh which, yeah, well, that's uh, that's uh, what's his name? Eddie Ganesha Stern Swami. and Robert Moses. Ganesha Swami. Oh, what's his name? Uh, the yogi, right? Namarupa. He does Namarupa. Eddie doesn't? Eddie Stern. Eddie Eddie yeah, uh -huh. Eddie, right, right. Eddie and and his partner Robert Moses, who lives in New, uh, New Hampshire. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I had some dialogues for Eddie over the years. Yes. I love he he introduced me, got me to like uh like Ganesha more. Yes. Like like yes. KD KD caused me to fall in love with Hanuman finally. Yes. I didn't quite get Hanuman before that until I until KD and, and Nim Karoli Baba. I, I met Nim, I never really met Nim Karoli Baba, sadly, because of my past relationship with Ramdas when he was Richard Alpert. Somehow I never made it over there, even uh -huh. though I lived in Amora. Or I would, Mora was a favorite place, you know, Lama Govinda living there. Yes. You know? uh -huh. I spent time up there in the early 70s. And did, um, you, did you meet Lama Govinda? Oh, yes, 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 very much. Oh, so. oh my goodness. He, he was a dear friend of ours. And uh, although he preferred, he liked my wife more than me. My wife was, was half German and half Swedish. And he was, she was like a foster daughter to him, you know. Ah. And she had lost her father when she was a teenager. So she gravitated to the older patron, you know, patrons, like uh -huh. proper figures like that. So then when he first looked at me, he was a little suspicious. You were like Madhyamaka. I don't know about that. You know, Tantra is more interesting. <laughs> like that. <laughs> so I, I was doing Madhyamaka at that time, scholarship. But he was great. Lama Govinda is truly great. He, he was a great scholar, too. You know, he was uh, he was at uh, right, Shantini Ketan, you know, he yes. knew everybody. He, he was really yeah, nice. He was... Really wonderful guy. 
mystic. You know, he he, he uh, discovered his former life to Juno Lit story in the in his White Clouds book. He tells it, where he discovered he was the reincarnation of a sort of somewhat obscure German poet. Oh, I I read that book about forty years ago. I don't remember the details of it at this point. Well, he was he was writing when he was a teenager. He was writing a book, the ultimate book of philosophy, and uh, and then he met someone. He lived in Capri at that time because his parents were proto hippies, and he lived in Capri. He had a Bolivian mother and a German father. Wow! And um, then he met someone at a at a party who kept staring at him, you know? and he didn't know why. Then he, later he asked the the lady, and she said, "Well, you look just like someone that he used to know, a German poet named so and so, and you look so strikingly much like that poet." But that's why he was looking at you. But he didn't try to talk to you or anything. But the hostess told him. So then he looked up the book. You know, he didn't. Have, he, he got not Kindle. He just got the book somehow from Germany, and the book was exactly what he was writing. I mean, sentence by sentence. Wow. So that's when he became oh reincarnation. <laughs> that's how he was got interested in. Before that, he was interested in North African Sufism, but that brought him into Buddhism. You know? He tells that story. That's in the book. I know it's not. A, it's only in a page or two in there, but he was like that. Amazing guy. Wow. Really serious person. That one of our, and he just loved the Mount Kailash. He went there, and, and he, he traveled around. He had this wonderful Parsi wife. Oh. Really famous from Mumbai, you know, legal time. I uh, spend quite a bit of time with Parsis myself. Oh really? Well, they're great. Yeah, great. Okay, well, listen, how can we, so do you ever come up here? Can do you ever teach, like you do retreats or weekends? or? Um, I, I used to, of course, now everything has changed. Now I do uh, all my teaching on, um, on Zoom. But um, hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, um, I have, uh, 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 KD and I do like to do things together in person. So, and KD lives not that far away from you. Yes, he does. He's nearby. So, um, it, uh, you know, we're he and I certainly have discussed the possibility of doing something there. So. Oh, good. Well, that might be fun. And uh, I'm very much. I don't know if you have heard that, but the Dalai Lama has added to his three aims of life. I don't know if you know that framework either. No, um, not, not very he's well. Always, in the last uh, 15, 20 years, he has proclaimed, well, he's analyzed what he did, I guess, and then he makes it a thing. If I have three aims in life as a human being to support the religion of kindness, you know, the transcendental, not any particular denomination, even right. secular, you know, secular humanism, even. Right. And as a human being, as a, as a Buddhist monk, I, my aim is to have m world religions not fight each other. And you know, not compete and and find the find the treasures of each other and beyond just tolerance, real respect, and cooperation. And third one, you know, he's told I don't know how many popes to, to sort of agree not to convert, <laughs> except except just learn from each other, you know, and and keep their own people. And he he promises, and he never does try to convert anybody to Buddhism himself. And um, and third one is as a Tibetan to speak of for his people. Those have been the sort of traditional things now for the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. Well, he's added lately, I think, well, he says longer than I heard about it for some reason, but he's emphasizing it lately. So then I sort of got into it. Fourth aim is bringing Indian inner science, the Buddhist part of it, the Nalanda library, the lost Nalanda library part of it, back from Tibet to India. But not as Buddhism, but as a complement, like a like a to Indian science, Indian inner science, to get the Indians to uphold their inner science against the materialists, you know, and strong, give them reinforcement to uphold that inner science against the materialists. So that right. his fourth aim in life is he's he says he's he's only lived twenty four years in Tibet eating momo. And he's lived since then 60, 62 years in India eating rice and dal. <laughs> so he's a son of India and especially a son of Nalanda. 
and therefore he wants to make this, you know, this is say he has this fourth aim that he's, in other words, he's been doing that. But of course, the Tibetans have been bringing back that flavor, you know, into everywhere. But the point is, he, he, now that's a formal aim, you know, like a fourth aim of life. You know? And so therefore, I naturally, I find myself very fascinated doing that. And, you know, jo you know George Feuerstein, who I never met, I was once shocked to read in one of his yoga books that if anybody wants to really go wherever it is in yoga, they have to learn about Vajrayana. Yeah. You know, he, he wrote, and then he sadly is not with us right. to pursue that. And uh, then Mallinson, you know, has discovered yeah. the uh, Amrita City thing, which is not really, he's taking his time to publish it, but it's sort of out, it's there. Uh, of the source of maybe Hatha Yoga Pradipika and the, the whole chakra thing and all of this sort of thing. You know, again, Sanderson's insistence that it all comes from Shaivism, you know. Yeah. But, but, but who cares, you know, in other words, it's, it's both, both of them have it going, but, and it's all great in either way. And I, 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 it's one of my, on my list is to study Abhinava more thoroughly to try to find out more about his, you know, Tantra Sara and his Tantra, whatever it's called, you know, his commentary on the Malini Vijaya and those things, you know, too, because he, he quotes Kalachakra and he yeah. knows about it. And as you know, the Kalachakra Mandala has all the Hindu deities yes. in the party as yeah. indivisible from the central Kalachakra, in fact. Yes. Although they're in their different places. But And the fun thing that I love about it, I don't know if you ever looked at the detail, but in that, you know, there's three, three buildings, you know, mind building, speech building, body building. Right. And in the speech building, Mrs. Ganesha, Mrs. Brahma, Mrs. Vishnu, and Mrs. Shiva, and Ms. everybody misses, Mrs. Skanda. They are the big dominant ones in the abyoms. They're yum yaps, in other words. Uh -huh. <laughs> the guys are little happy little guys in their laps. Do you know what I mean? Wow. And then in the body mandala, they revert to being the subordinate female, you know, and, the, and, and Ganesha and, and Kumara and all of them are big shot Shiva. They have their shaktis, you know, and of course, Kalachakra has has ten shaktis around him, naturally, and they and they are all interfused with them. So it really, it you know, whatever the story of Shambhala really means, it's really something very mergeable with Kashmir Shaivas. I mean, that's why they are so close. I think, but mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't know the other side of it well enough to be able to really do it. But anyway, I'm trying to develop something with Richard Freeman. Yeah. And students are called Vajra Yoga, so that so people will will have kind of Mahayana, not just Vajrayana, but Mahayana, even even Stabilavada, uh, you know, or Pratimokshayana, as I like to call it. The, I never like the word Hinayana. I call it Pratimokshayana mm. or Stabilavada, and um, the eighteen different schools of that, uh, which is all very necessary to is all part of Tantra, as far as I'm concerned. Part of our trail. It's like they're all interwoven, the three of them. And um, so I'm trying to develop that. From at least my, I'm, a, I'm a lousy yogi, you know, but, but I've been too sedentary and too much of a desk jockey, as the Japanese say, call it. But although I'm trying to stretch out a little bit now and, and straighten up my upper back instead of hunting over a computer all the Stretching time. Stretching is good. But anyway, I'm trying to do that. So I'm so thrilled to rediscover you. And I hope we can have a real dialogue. The other thing is, you know, I was um, I was um, indentured. Talk about <laughs> indentured servitude. I was indentured by the Dalai Lama and my Mongolian uh, root uh, spiritual friend to set up something that would translate the whole tenure. Oh. You know, back into English. And when I complained, they said, oh, not in one life, naturally. He <laughs> said... You, you know, you just set up the thing, and then three generations later, maybe it'll be a bit more done. And that's why I created the thing at Columbia to be sort of an engine of that. And um, and then there's all those medical texts. You mentioned, I was thrilled to see, you mentioned that there's certain Ayurveda texts even that are only available in Tibetan because yes. of the burning of the library of Nalanda, you know? Yes. And we really need a project. Over the years, I've had various donors say... Oh, I would like to support translation of medical texts, and blah, blah, blah. And then I, I would, didn't have the, the people and the money or anything to sort of try to, because they didn't, they weren't billionaires, unfortunately. So I, I just couldn't get going on that yet. But I really would like to see that. 
Do you know Eric Rosen? Uh, um, uh, what's his name? Eric Rosenberg. No, it's not Rosenberg. Eric Rosen. My friend Eric. He's Bush. a student of Dr. Nida. And Dr. He does, he Eric studied- Rosenbush. Rosa what? Rosenbush. Bush. Oh, Rosenbush, Bush. that's it. Yeah. Rosenbush. I, you know him? I have... I have heard of him and heard of Dr. Nida, but I don't believe I've met either. Right, right. So anyway, Eric, Nida doesn't really know that much about Ayurveda, but Eric's one of Nida's students, and he's pretty good with Tibetan medicine, kind of a practitioner, I think, in India, and he had herb gardens and things going here and there in India at different times. But he's, um, but he also had studied with Ayurvedic gurus, and he, he sort of is good about the bridge of that. And he wants to also work on that. His, his, He's developed a school for Tibetan medicine in, in Nepal uh, before COVID, anyway. I, I think it still exists, and they will hope to revive it. And uh, he's, uh, he's a really good guy. You'd like him. He'd like, you'd, you'd get along, you too. So anyway, I hope we can do that kind of thing in the future a little bit if you're inclined. Well, let's, let's see what happens. I mean, hopefully um, things will move forward, and they will certainly move forward in the way they're supposed to move forward. And um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm certainly uh, excited by all the various possibilities that are there. I'm especially excited that you know Professor Bahulkar, because oh, yeah. I first met him, I don't know, 40 years ago, when he was still living in Pune before he moved to Sarnath. Right, right. Well, he's back and, in Pune now. Oh, he's back in Pune. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that's great. He, um, I mean... He, he's he's not only so knowledgeable he's just such a fine fine example of what a a human being and he a is. scholar can be when they come together in a happy he way is wonderful yeah he worked with us long term on the guhisamaja great guhisamaja commentary uh-huh. oh. by Kirti, uh called the pradipodyotana by you know which which we think is the same gender Kirti, you know same Narajuna, same Tantra Kirti. Same. You know, the Westerners have them all in the 10th century because right. they're so nervous about Tantra. They're so embarrassed about their misunderstanding of it right. that they can't believe that it's as old as the Buddha even. Right. And uh, anyway, Sri Kant did a great uh, uh, editing of the Sanskrit of the Pradipodhyotana. So when we worked on trying, um, we're trying to translate it very slowly. And um, I'll, 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 I will try to send you these things. Do you have? A, do you, are you? Is that where you plan to stay in Houston for some time? Um, well, I'm. I'm hoping to get back to to Bombay. Uh, Vimalananda's foster daughter is not well, and oh, I've been dear. staying with her family for whenever I'm in Bombay for the past uh, forty five years. Oh so, my. God. But naturally, they want to go back. Um, I do need to go back, and there's some things uh, in in her in that uh, reality that need to. What do you that, think about these Delta variants and all this crap in India? Do you think that it, they can balance out, or? Well, I'm. I, I mean, it seems to me that that the 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 virus is doing what it is what is the right thing for it, which is becoming more. Uh, more transmissible Mm -hmm. and it hasn't quite started moving in the direction of being less deadly it's not that deadly but it it needs to be it needs to become it's moving in the direction of what it's going to become which is it will become a common cold virus at some point i see three other coronaviruses are already common cold viruses so i see it's not an intelligent virus that kills off the people that it infects you just yeah. want them to spread as a virus you just want to spread killing people is inefficient <laughs> how do we understand from my point of view how do we understand virus and bacteria difference i mean something that wants to spread seems to be motivated and yet it's not supposed to be sentient uh well i'm in 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 uh, i'm i it, of course there are many people who practice ayurveda who are quite materialistic and they only think about things in materialistic terms but mm-hmm. thanks to the influence of vimalananda in my opinion everything is sentient it's yeah, certain okay. things are less sentient than others right 
But when it comes to something that has the ability, uh, like a bacteria, bacteria are extraordinarily sentient. We're finding yeah. out, uh, I've been doing quite a bit of studying about the microbiome recently. and uh, Yes, yes, wonderful. And, and it's, it's just so characteristic of human beings that um, we have assumed for so long that we are, by virtue of not being literal parasites, that we are independent somehow of the environment when really hu a human being, I like, I like the fancy word that is being applied now, we are really holobionts. <laughs> and a holobiont is a bunch of different organisms that come together and behave like one organism. So a lichen is kind of like a right. holobiont. That's right. And that's what a human being is. If we didn't have all these bacteria and viruses and fungi, yes. we would not exist. There yes. would be no humans. Yes, yes, right. Right. Fantastic. Holobion. Holobions united, seeking to be infinibions. Infinibions. Yes. Seek, <laughs> seeking to transcend. That's yeah. what we're doing. So, the infinite holobion. I love that. That's so wonderful. Well, listen, you know, this is probably, you know, the, the audience can't stand it to go on and on as I would yes, like to. indeed. But it's such an honor and a delight to meet you. Well, really. and a great pleasure and honor to meet All you. All my friends. And really uh, look forward to, to meeting you the next time. And, and yes, uh, absolutely. may all of your projects move forward in a and good thank direction. You, thank you. Well, let's work together. I'd like to work together on this inner science, fourth aim of his holiness's life. Yes, and uh, and also I like I like to find out the the Abhinava Abhinava and and Vardana and those other guys in Kashmir and who they really were talking to because the Buddhists don't know, and then where how did the Shambhala people get involved with them and where did they come from, and obviously they know everything that's going on in India the Shambhala people you know, and um, which you can tell from the way they they discuss it. And, you know, the Pundarika and these people, the author yeah. of, the, of the Vimala Prabha. And so, um, um, anyway, it's really fun seeing you. So thank you so much, Robert Certainly. Savoda. Thank everyone. you, sir. The great Robert Savoda. And they can find your works at the Lotus Press and the uh, Lod, uh, Basant Lod's uh, Press also. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. You can just, uh, you can go to my website and it's easy okay. enough to find just, everything uh, there. Robert Savoda will come. It's D R S V O B O D A, Dr. Svoboda, D R Svoboda.com. D R, no, no dot, just no dot. D R Svoboda. What is Svoboda? Is that Russian? Uh, Czech. Czech. Ah, okay. My father's parents were from Moravia. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Well, you, you, you forgot your Czech. I never learned. My father could not speak English until he was six. He oh. only spoke uh, Czech and, and Spanish. Well, Mexican, because all his all the kids he played with were Mexican, and and his parents and and uh, brother and sister only spoke Czech. That's so great. Okay, okay, Robert Svoboda, thank you so much. Okay. Yes, sir. Sarva Mangalam, as they say. I don't know what you say. Tashi Dele, we say in Tibetan. <laughs> People remember it by thinking my old friend Robert uh, Alan Adwell. A yogi friend, a painter friend, he said he just remembers it as trash in the lake. <laughs> uh, well, uh, okay, uh, whichever mnemonic works for you, exactly.